check, check, mic check, 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 mic check. <laughs> Welcome to Podcast Envy. I am your podcast boss, Andrea Klender, and today I have one of my very favorite all-time guests. And in fact, this is not the first time that I have had the opportunity to interview the fabulous Elsie Escobar. So as we are bringing 2018 toward a close, we are also bringing toward a close our Podcast Envy series on podcasting and social impact. We have had some amazing interviews and guests on this topic. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to go back in time and listen to all of our impact podcasters. Yep, impact podcasters. That is a phrase that I picked up from today's guest, Elsie. And what do you need to know about Elsie? I don't want to talk too long because I just want to get to this incredible interview. And on that note, you should definitely refer back to the show notes for this episode, episode number 40, which you can find at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash pod envy zero four zero for episode 40. There, I will have linked back to my original interview with Elsie long ago for The Creative Imposter, episode number 44, in which we are primarily talking about creativity and imposter syndrome. But because Elsie is like the queen of podcasters, I'm just giving you that title, Elsie. <laughs> we, of course, talk podcasting in that episode as well. And I promise you the content is not duplicate. It is complementary to what you are about to hear on this episode of Podcast Envy. So this thread, this thread of social impact is one that's a little bit difficult in the podcasting world in general. I feel that there is a strong focus right now on downloads, stats, numbers, monetization, visibility. How can this show support my business? What is the least amount of effort that I can put in to get the maximum amount of output? Of course, that sounds very cold and shallow, and I know not everyone is thinking that, but when I look in the Facebook groups for podcasters, when I get questions at the classes that I teach here in Chicago, a lot of times it's focused on how can I make a podcast that supports my business or my brand how can I get more listeners? How can I grow my following? How can I get sponsors? How do I make money? And those questions are all valid. But the deeper question is, why make a podcast at all? What is the true value of the show that you are creating? For whom? And how do you really maximize that value. This is a little bit of the what you put in is what you get out mentality. And it is also a little bit of the viewpoint that we don't just create things in order to get paid. We don't just create things in order to become famous or well-known. We don't just create things because it's the trendy, popular, cool thing to do. We create things because creating has meaning. Creating matters. And to that end, I just wanted to give you a couple of notes about the episode. So there is a point in which Elsie references an art exhibit that consists of a brick wall and a book. And I don't want to give too much away, but thanks to my trusty podcast editing apprentice, Maddie Shuchuk, we did find the exhibit that she was talking about. And this is an installation from 2007 that is often referred to on the internet as the impact of a book. But I believe the actual name of the piece is Chapter 6, The Castle, by a Mexican artist named Jorge Mendez Blake. And this is part of a series of installations that the artist, who is professionally an architect, but whose work revolves around books, libraries, and literature. So there's a whole series of these book installations. And the particular one that she was referencing, I believe, is this chapter six, The Castle, which centers around the book called The Castle by Franz Kafka. 
So in any case, a little bit of backstory about what the heck she's talking about, because in the moment, I had not a clue. And of course, we will link to the website for Jorge Mendez Blake and the images for the exhibit that she is mentioning in the show notes for this episode, which I already told you you can find at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash pod NV 040 linked in the description for this episode in whatever app you are using to listen. One other note that I want to make about the episode is that several times we reference something called the E-League, and the E-League is a podcast mentoring program that Elsie facilitates at this point several times per year, and I was a part of the very first cohort of the E-League. This is a mentoring program for podcasters who have been producing a show for a minimum of six months, so it's not exactly for newbies, specifically on this concept of impact podcasting, people who to know that there is more to their show and more to what they're creating than just the show, <laughs> than just what is showing up right now. And I can't really say enough about this program. It's one that keeps evolving and evolving and changing and growing and is highly informed by the podcasters who join each session of the E-League. I received a ton of value from mentoring with Elsie and also from connecting with fellow e-leaguers. We've really created a strong community that is just growing and growing of podcasters who have this mindset of social impact. And this does not mean that everyone who joins has a show that the topic is social impact. There is a wide range a very wide range of topics that are represented in the podcasters that are part of the E-League. And so if you are wondering if it might be a fit for you, I will definitely recommend that you check out the website and schedule a time to connect with Elsie. She has not yet announced the dates for the first 2019 e-league cohort. However, I'd encourage you to go to her website linked in the show notes to see if the program might be right for you. One final quick note. As you can tell, we are almost out of time in 2018. Does that sound stressful or does that sound exciting? <laughs> Next week, Christmas Eve, we will not be releasing an episode of Podcast Envy, but we will be back with one final episode to close out the year on New Year's Eve. You won't want to miss it. Okay. I said I didn't want to talk too long, and it's already, quote, too long, unquote. Here's my conversation with the queen of podcasting, Elsie Escobar. Elsie Escobar, thank you so much for joining me on Podcast Envy. Hey, I am thrilled to be here with you, love. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. So we are here talking about podcasting and social impact, and I'm not sure I would even be here doing this series on Podcast Envy if it weren't for you. So I knew oh. I couldn't let the series go by without getting you on here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That means a lot. That means a ton for me, for sure. I can't imagine that anyone listening to this show right now doesn't know who you are. But, <laughs> but just for fun, why don't you tell us who you are in your words, what your shows are, and what podcasting and social impact means to you? Well, I've been podcasting now for over a decade. I got into it just because I loved it so very, very much. And because I kind of got in at the right time, I was incredibly privileged to start working in podcasting very early on for Libsyn, which is the largest podcasting host and distribution network. So in addition to podcasting myself, I also got a really big look behind the scenes of the podcasting industry through a very unique lens, which was varied in scope, meaning that I got a chance to work in sales, meaning sales for podcast ads and establishing things like that, campaigns. I had an opportunity to kind of talk one-on-one -on -one with newbie podcasters. I had an opportunity to really dive deep into people's presence in podcasting, how to help podcasters get their message out through, you know, hosting companies' lens and things like that. So I had an opportunity to do all those things. But in the middle of doing that sort of like as a job, I also was podcasting myself. And I started with Elsie's yoga class in 2006. And then... Which is how um, I first discovered you. <laughs> That's right. Originally, way back. <laughs> way back. And then I did one other show. I don't know if you know this, Andrea. 
I did another show in 2007 as well. And it was with my, at that time, we were very close, my friend Hilary Rubin. And we lived very close together in Los Angeles when we were both yoga teachers at the time. And we started a podcast called Mudra Moments. And it was essentially two urban yoga teachers talking about the realities of teaching yoga at that time. And we would get together at our house and we would record on our couch. And that was really like when we published those episodes, people like loved Mudra Moments like crazy. But again, I think even when I was podcasting as a yoga teacher, I was a little bit ahead of my time. And also so were Hillary and myself with doing the show together. And then I moved. I kind of left Los Angeles and it was kind of hard to continue because I was also not teaching as much as I was anymore. And that was changing and all this stuff. So anyway, long story short, I ended up creating the podcast for Lipson, which is called The Feed, the official Lipson podcast. So that's my officially sort of like my third podcast that I put together. We've been going strong with that one for five years. And then a year after that, I started another podcast and it's called She Podcast, which is a show about podcasting from the women's point of view. And so those are the things that I am currently doing. In terms of impact and in terms of all of that, at this moment now in my career in podcasting, <laughs> and it's a decade in, part of the reason that I love this medium was because of the social impact and because it struck me so deeply like this medium, my God, did it change my life. Like when I started it, not just because I had an opportunity to make a podcast, but because it empowered me to speak. It empowered me to have a voice. It helped me differentiate myself in a profession, and I'm talking yoga at that time, that was solely always one way of doing it. And I thought, oh, I want to do it this way. This is the way that feels really great to me. And the podcast really helped me with that. But unbeknownst to me, I was just going to fall in love more with the power that it gave me and the impact that it facilitated to me, not only as a host, but as a listener. And I think that the listening aspect is a huge thing that has helped me be where I am now, because I wouldn't be in a position where I am today as a leader in podcasting. Like I was inducted into the Podcasting Hall of Fame. Yay for me. <laughs> but all of that stuff I think really came from my ability to, because I love podcasting so much. I love listening. And it was through podcasts that I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I think that one of the things that really impacted me when I was working with you through the E-League, which is a mentoring program that you created for podcasters who wanted to do more with their show or figure out where we fit into the ecosystem of podcasting and how we can really take things a step deeper. One of the things that I really started to think about was not just how to make my show better or become a better podcaster or even beyond how to get more people to listen to my show is to really think about the potential impact that the show I'm creating could have for listeners and how to really capitalize, not in the sense of like marketing or in the sense of making money, but how to capitalize on that impact and really have that become a primary focus for the decisions that I'm making around what I'm creating. How is it that you decided that you were going to become an advocate for this way of looking at podcasting? Part of it was fueled by you guys. It was that I was getting incredibly frustrated by seeing women like you, women of the E-League, essentially, because all the women that step into that type of work are working in a different way category, I feel. Uh, that's one way to put it, because everybody is seeking more, but nobody is speaking the language of simply saying, like, how can I build a business with this? Or how can I market my show? Intrinsically in your work, more is happening. And I resonated with that. And my frustration came with the sense that more people need to listen to these women. More people need to know who these women are. Because they have such skill and such power that the world needs to take note. 
Unfortunately, the world is set up in a way that sometimes we won't hear, or it's not set up to cast light on the type of work that you and your fellow e-leaguers are doing. And so I thought, how can I help? How can I help this happen? And then I started to think about the access that I have in this space and that I could use that to benefit not only myself, but you guys, right? And part of it is that I've always come from a place of, it really is hard for me to just think about myself with these things, like when it comes to building a business or when it comes to doing anything in terms of a job, I've always put impact above and beyond anything else vision or mission or the things that I believe in. And I had become sort of disconnected within the podcasting space by people keeping asking me questions about, you know, what microphone do I need to have? Or how can I get more listeners? Or like the questions seem to stay at a, in yoga speak, they were resonating at a very low level. (laughs) And I was like, there is so much more to be asking. And instead of sort of dismissing those conversations, I started to think, how can I change the conversation? How can I then articulate the questions in a way that is going to empower you to ask bigger questions of your work instead of looking for a solution? And then I thought, like, how in the heck am I going to sell that? Because that's, really like, <laughs> that's so not sexy. You know what I mean? But what I started to think is, like, obviously, I want to know those questions. That's what I really resonate with. And so that's where it started to come from, because then it became really easy for me to talk about my work because it mattered to me. And I became so much more passionate about it because, you know, even with She Podcast, we did Podcasting School for Women, which we need that type of work as well. We need the basic, like, this is how you do it. Put these things here, checklists, solutions, and you have a podcast. Like, you need that stuff. You need to have those questions answered. But I found myself really resisting even telling people about that. And I found myself resisting telling people that they could hire me to start a podcast. And I was like, what is up with that? That's when I started to shift the lens. And I was like, it's because I want to have deeper, more meaningful conversations that talk about impact. That was my bottom line. And so with you, every time like I listen to any of your podcasts, I come out of it changed in some way. There's an idea that's just come into my head There is a passion that I can sense from the lens that you use for the conversations. There is, I guess, an insight that I have to people whenever I dive into their online personalities and whatever that might be, where I can kind of peel through the facade, if you will, and get Mm -hmm. to the heart of the matter. And then when I get in there, that's when I'm really happy. I'm like, okay, this is what matters, dude. (laughs) (laughs) You know, this is it. And that really fires me up. And then I can really speak into that with passion. And I have no fear about knowing that I can deliver results based on higher conversations. The other ones I can too, but you know, they're not very interesting to me. (laughs) So, eh. So I just feel like you have to follow the impact. For me, I have to resonate with that. It's like I handpicked people that I wanted to work with. I made, did I tell you this? I made a list, (laughs) all of you guys. And I just started to write who I wanted to work with for the E-League. And I still continue to do that. And I write them down and I don't do anything but that. And eventually y'all walk through my door. (laughs) So It's really like magic. I love it so much. I know. It's so great. The idea of this is the work that I want to be doing. This is what I think really matters. But how do I sell it? Because it's not the sexy topic. I felt that way a little bit at this year's podcast movement, because Mm -hmm. one of the things that you were a huge advocate for, and I don't know all the behind the scenes of how this came to be, is the new social impact track, the advocacy track that they added to the podcast movement conference this year. And I applied to speak as part of that track at your recommendation and was selected to speak on the podcast mentoring program that I do with high school students 
in Chicago. And there was this part of me that was so happy to be speaking and knew that I had a really great presentation that could really resonate with people on a lot of levels. And I also knew that it was kind of a niche topic because most people at Podcast Movement, I would say, are newer podcasters or just starting out and have those beginning questions, right? How do I start? How do I get an audience? What hosting company should I use? What equipment should I use? And they're just trying to figure out the basics. And to take it a step further and talk about the potential for podcast mentoring feels like a lot of people aren't in that mindset yet or don't know that that's something that they're interested in. So I had this fear that the only people in the room were going to be my friends and the people who already know me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Fortunately, that didn't happen. Fortunately, I did have strangers in the room, (laughs) but not a lot. I mean, I probably had, I'm going to say I had like maybe 30 or so really awesome people who were very engaged in the audience. And I had so much positive feedback, but it is hard when you see another speaker who is talking about some kind of logistical thing or some kind of marketing thing and they have a packed room, right? So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to really like feel confident in that, like, no, I'm going to stick with advocacy and social impact. (laughs) Yeah, it is. You know, hats off to you, Andrea, because this is just, it's just the beginning and this is what it takes. It absolutely is a challenge and you really need to love it because there's a lot of resistance, because there's a lot of people that don't understand that it's necessary, because there is so much that a lot of us don't want to think about this stuff. You know, it's hard. It's work to think a lot about some of these, even just like advocacy, just helping people know things. One of the questions that in the e-link that has come up a lot too is transcriptions, but not transcriptions in the sense of how do we get better SEO, but how do we serve Mm -hmm. and how do you respond to somebody who emails you and says, is there a way that you can offer transcripts because I really want to listen to your show, but I am unable to. And When you get stuff like that, there's a part of you that's like, well, dude, do you know that I'm doing this for free? (laughs) But then there's another part where it's like, how are we going to shift that mindset if we don't address that and really kind of step into the discomfort of those conversations? And I had the same thing, too. Like one of the first sessions that I brought into podcast movement before the advocacy track was established was one that was around the cultural impact of podcasting, if you will. And I didn't know where to put it, of course, because it didn't fit anywhere. And I wanted to have more of a challenging conversation. And in the process, I realized when I looked at the schedule, I'm like, people aren't going to come to this because there's like all of these other sessions that are so much more, in quote, appealing (laughs) to go to. And so I thought, what can I do? What do I need to do now to make this happen, to get people in the room? And part of it is that I had to market the tar out of it, you know? I had to sit there and put so much energy in getting people in the room, in talking up my guests of the panel and doing as much as I could to fire them up, to know that we need to have this conversation. And it was really great to have that support from my own panelists. And then in the room, no, there weren't that many people in that room that day. But I do feel that the people that did show up got a lot. And I still get questions about that, or I know that there were some really key connections made. And if I would have just thought like, oh, I just want to have more people in the room. It's just, I don't know. You know, it's like, I'm not, I'm just not there. I'd rather pave the way. That's why I started podcasting in the first place, (laughs) you know, but you're right. It is challenging. And for those of you who want to be impact podcasters, or for those of you who are thinking about how can this happen? Impact isn't necessarily big sometimes. And when I say big, I'm talking about the amount of people as Mm -hmm. in like volume, right? Have you seen that there's like an art piece and it is a big wall and there's a book at the bottom? Have you seen this? I don't think so. I'm sure one of you guys that is listening are going to see this. So it's an art piece. I'm not even sure where, if it's a European museum or in the United States. And it seems, I think it's a very gigantic wall made from bricks, like a brick wall, right? But at the bottom of the wall, like right at the center on the foundational part of it, there's a book that has been stuck in the bottom part. 
And so what it does is you can see that obviously the wall is still standing and the wall is still the wall. But the way that the book is making the wall move is really impactful visually. You realize, obviously, the idea of this is how much power or how much impact one little book can have. But Hmm. if you only see that larger thing, you don't really see that much of an impact, but you can see that it's small, tiny, incremental movement, one for the other. And I mean, now kind of to stay topical on the goings on of what happened in the U.S. Open and what was going on with Serena Williams and the empire and all of these things that ended up happening too at that moment in the U.S. Open. And one of the things that Serena said is that, and it's heartbreaking because she sincerely said, I just want to bring awareness to this imbalance here that this injustice, maybe it didn't work out for me, but it might work out for the next woman, Mm -hmm. you know? And unfortunately, we're not in a position where we're going to say something and we're going to change the world. And that's why I feel that e-league is so important. And, And one of the tenets that I teach is teaching language that you can repeat. And part of that is the fact that it came from you, Andrea, you knowing what I'm about. You know that changing this conversation and me being able to share that with you and therefore you going, oh my God, that totally makes sense. I also want to do something like this or I want to take this on. So now my words have impacted you to then make these words yours and do it your way. Mm -hmm. That to me is impact. And so it's not that you're emulating me or wanting me or it's because of me. Well, it might have been at some point, but really it just empowered you to ask the best questions to do it on your own, in your own terms. And then you'll do the same for your kids, for the young adults that you're teaching or in these new jobs that you're stepping into. Like that impact doesn't need to be vast. Oh, it's podcast angel time, and it would not be right to be talking with the producer and co-host of The Feed, the official Libsyn podcast, without thanking Libsyn for all of their support for the many podcasts that I produce and edit and support, and to recommend to you Libsyn's hosting services. If you have not yet launched your show and you're confused about where the audio files go or or who is the best host for you, or why should I pay for hosting when there are free hosts? Head scratch. There's an episode earlier in the Podcast Envy archives all about that. I 100% wholeheartedly recommend Libsyn's hosting services. Totally affordable, totally reliable, and there are so many benefits and perks to working with Libsyn that you cannot get anywhere else that I just cannot come up with a reason not to host with them. You can, of course, find a link for Libsyn's hosting services in the show notes for this episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash pod envy zero four zero. And don't forget, when you do sign up for hosting services with Libsyn, you will want to use the promo code envy, that's E-N-V-Y, to get a free month. And then they will know that I referred you and then they will send me a wee little check to say thanks. Here's a quick tip. Libsyn hosts a free quick start webinar the first Wednesday of every month. When you go to Libsyn.com to check out their services, they have an events page. And when you scroll down on the events page, you will see where you can sign up for the podcasting quick start webinar. I highly recommend it. Also, if you're not even there yet and you really need some help getting your show started, I encourage you to join the first ever podcast NV launch pod group coaching session. We will be starting at the end of January with a small group of podcasters who all want to get their shows ready for spring 2019, and we will do it together. Take the mystery out of podcasting. Take the fear out of podcasting. Turn that into excitement, purpose, and momentum, and you will be all set to go with your show for spring. You can learn more about the launch pod at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash launch pod envy. I think that's hard in an industry where we're so focused on numbers and downloads and statistics. And I I know that's a soapbox that you could climb really high. (laughs) (laughs) And I've done I've done a couple episodes here on podcast envy as well about downloads and stats and numbers. And there's this question of, okay, 
Well, if that's the unit of measure that we have for success, how do we measure impact? How do we know that we're making a difference? How do we know that that one person who's listening is going to see the world differently, have that new idea, make a change, feel differently about themselves, and then possibly spread that beyond themselves? How do we measure that? How do we know whether or not our podcast matters? Right. This is a great question. And (laughs) I ask it all the time, too. I mean, almost those same exact words came out of my mouth (laughs) when I was leading a panel at Podcast Movement where I had the honor of like moderating four female CEOs for radio. And this is for commercial radio. And I was I was a little like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? I'm nothing. What do I have to offer? I always felt so out of my league. But alas, <laughs> you know, they're starting to come in. And it's one of those things where they are also coming from a place of, oh, my gosh, however they get their data. It's by far a lot more than what they're going to be seeing currently with their shows. There's not going to be the type of scope, supposedly, as flawed as that measurement standard is in radio, the same as when they just randomly launch a podcast that isn't driven by a big star power name of some kind. And my question to them was that exactly that. How are you going to measure whether or not this show is successful minus what you're used to measuring? right? Those numbers. Mm -hmm. How do you know it's worth keeping going? And I didn't get an answer (laughs) (laughs) because people don't really want to answer. But my bet is on community building and setting up the dialogue early on and being a detective. So what that means is making sure, especially for podcasts, and I think that this is a lot more important than in anything else, When you're starting your podcast, there has got to be a back and forth in some way. There has to be an understanding from the audience that this is a dialogue. And yes, you can contact me. And yes, you can tell me. And for you to be clear, precise, and unrelenting about asking for feedback. And I'm not saying like, you know, give me feedback, just like random feedback, but to really say just in the same way that I was talking earlier about the art exhibit thing. And I asked, hey, guys that are listening to the show, if you guys come into it, send her a link to that exhibit from whatever that museum is. Mm -hmm. Right. So then we can start that and you can email, tell them the email. Where are they emailing you, Andrea? (laughs) Andrea at thecreativeimposter.com. Okay, so you got it right there. (laughs) Andrea at thecreativeimposter.com. You can send her an email and tell her that and ask. You don't waste anything to be able to do it and incorporate it inside and to know that, oh my gosh, somebody is listening. Somebody is going to be able to tell you and to say thank you and to respond right? Mm -hmm. Because that's where it begins. That's where you know somebody is listening. And it's not somebody's listening, oh my God, but it's like they're engaging with you. And that's part of the process that we're all here together. That's the number one thing that I start to feel. And the other thing is for you to be a detective. Some of the times we're like, why are people sharing certain things of yours? What kinds of engagement am I getting on what posts and why? What was the question that I asked? that really caused this much level of engagement here? How did that happen? And then see if we can replicate it and then see if we can streamline it in some way. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen overnight. Like you can't do a week of, you know, let's say a podcast episode and a slew of your social media posts in different places and then expect to get all the data back from that one week and then adjust. No, you actually have to do it for a while. I'm thinking like maybe three months of consistent taking action in your part, trying different things, keeping an eye out, putting the shows out, getting the CTAs in there, and then starting to see like what's working, what's not working. How can I shift this a little more? And it's in that testing process that you start to develop an understanding of your audience, uh, how it stands. And breaking patterns, you know, breaking patterns of behavior. And one of the things that I really teach a lot, especially with those of us that are trying to reach possibly different parts of society that at times may not necessarily have the access to be listening to your show, 
then you're going to have to think outside the box because they might not be where podcasters in totality <laughs> tend to hang out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we get a little lazy in the way that we promote our show. And this is what we do. And so what is it that you need to do to get to that audience? My biggest thing now is really promoting podcasts through Spotify and Google Podcasts because those two are outside of the scope of Apple Podcasts. And Apple Podcasts is still the number one leader at this moment. That's where the majority of downloads come from in the totality of the shows. But these other places started to come through, Spotify and Google Podcasts. And so being able to bring these front and center to all of those people that possibly are Android users, that they didn't even know that they could do this, now can do this. So doing that kind of stuff is super important. But for me, it's a full-time job, not even to just get the word out, but to observe, <laughs> to see what's working, to get that data, to observe other podcasts, to see why they're getting engagement versus why this person isn't. So that's my biggest love is for me to reverse engineer success of podcasts. I love that. Like, I love to see, like, how come their Patreon page is so massive? And then I sit there and I break it down. I look at the publishing schedule. I listen to the content. I look at the type of themes that they have going on, like what category they land in, what's the existing fandom, if you will, or audience for that show. And then I take out the biggest sort of X factors, which is what I like to call them, to see like, okay, they have this, this, and this going on for them that is different than for somebody who's going to be launching a show that has nothing to do with this. What is it that we, as an up-and-coming show, can emulate from this larger point, right? You take away all those X factors to see what really can work for us. Do you have any examples off the top of your head that you can think of of a show that you think is doing something really outside of the box or something really amazing in the social impact category. Yeah, you know, I had a client hire me specifically because she was considering doing a network. So she hired me to do her research for her so that I could kind of lay the law of the land, if you will, like give her all the pros and the cons and all of the minutia of running a network that maybe she hadn't thought about. And so I went ahead and I kind of bumped into a podcast that she actually told me about. It's called Pantsuit Politics. And the last time that I checked out the show, it's been a while, so I haven't looked back uh, for a little bit, but I really had the ability to kind of see where their success came from. And I started to map it out. And one of the interesting things that ended up happening and what I saw the biggest X factor for them was, is the fact that they started the show right around, like, I think, like, possibly a year before the election. So, like, January 2016-ish, if mm -hmm. I may be wrong on that, or maybe November 2015 or something like that. That's when they had started. And the show was very average in terms of downloads, like all of us, right? Like most of us. Let me give you the concept. So the concept is two women. One woman is a Republican. The other one's a Democrat. And so they come together to have nuanced conversation. And so as the election started to come through, obviously, craziness started to happen. And then mm -hmm. their show started to really grow right around that fall area, right before the election. And then after the election, it busted, like especially in that January, January 2017. So that for me, what that showed is that there was a huge need for these women's voices at that moment. The space was right for them. But it took a year for that to happen. Who would have thought, though, that Donald Trump was going to be elected president. That was an X factor. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. was, that was kind of, at least for me, it was. I was like, this isn't really going to happen. And it totally did. And therefore, everybody was scrambling, trying to figure out what are we going to do? And all of a sudden, that show took off because then Apple Podcasts was featuring tons of political podcasts. They happened to be a great content at that time, started to push it out there. They're also incredibly opinionated. They're very present in social media as well. That's another really wonderful thing that they do that is incredible. So they happen to be at the right place at the right time. They had already established what the conversation was about. And it literally was like, oh, look, here's a podcast with two women, Republican, Democrat. Here we go. 
Now, mm-hmm. in terms of growing their Patreon stuff and things like that, one thing that I love that they also offer is that they do these like super in-depth I don't even know what they call them. But they're like deep dives into like the Declaration of Independence. And so they really dive straight into it almost sentence by sentence and they dissect it. It's kind of like a history lesson Mm -hmm. by your BFFs and they release it on their feed and it's awesome. But then they take those off their regular feed and they put it behind their Patreon paywall. So if you become a Patreon, you can get access to all of that. And they refer to it a lot in the show in a really natural way. Something like, well, remember when we talked about the Declaration of Independent, an article, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. If you want access to it, it's at our Patreon. And so immediately you're going to go like, oh, there's other stuff there. I didn't know. But they also don't deprive their fans or their people who subscribe from not getting it. They put it on the feed and it's out on the feed. But there comes a point when they just remove it off the feed. Interesting. So if you have it, you have it. Like I could just download all those special episodes that they have and just keep them. And then, you know, I don't have to become a Patreon. They've also started to write a book and they've been started to become speakers at different places. They've been hired to come in and talk about political stuff. So not necessarily. And this is the other thing, too. They've been talking about what they want to talk about versus how to have a successful Patreon as a podcaster. (laughs) Because I could feel that too. It's like, I don't want them to talk about how they build the Pantoot Politics brand. I want them to talk about what they're passionate about, Mm -hmm. which is educating us about politics and being respectful to one another when we don't agree, essentially. Yeah, so it's like they had that right place, right time, but they also were very consistent prior to it being the right time. Like they couldn't have necessarily predicted exactly what conditions would come up, but they already were building something based upon their concept, based upon their passion, based upon their expertise. Also, it wasn't like, oh, we're doing all this social media to promote the podcast. The podcast is part of a whole ecosystem of Mm -hmm. content and activity around the central topic. Absolutely. They were essentially ready for that, right? And I also noticed that it wasn't until they hit that sort of like rise in terms of download numbers at the beginning of 2017 that they even started to consider the conversation of monetization Mm -hmm. because they recognized that. I mean, this is all like in the back end of me doing detective work, right? (laughs) And so I listened to their shows and I realized they didn't have any advertisers before, yeah. Right. And so it wasn't until the numbers were there that they started to even go like, OK, how do we monetize this thing that we have now? Right. And I think that that's something else, because I think as impact builders, we must be super clear about what we're bringing to the table before we can start to ask for money. And mm-hmm. when I say that, I'm not saying that you can't sell your services for sure. I mean, we all can do that. But I'm telling you from experience that there comes a point when you are so clear about what your mission is or what your impact is or what you're bringing to the table, then the ability to think outside the box and how to bring money into that becomes easier. It doesn't need to fit into a little like, oh, you do memberships (laughs) or you do, you know, you sell ads. Like it doesn't have to move into this box. And the way that I started to do that was with the E-League. And the E-League is a very, like, I'm still figuring it out. Like, it's not even, Mm -hmm. I'm still figuring out what this is. I know that it pulses. I know that it breathes. I know that there's new stuff that comes up all the time. But I know that it's really based on a deep, dialogue between the women who step into this conversation with me and we collectively create this thing together, right? I can't dictate what that's going to be and what it's going to feel like every single time that I run it. But the heart of it is intimate conversation and mentorship because I want to be there to help you get to whatever you want to do. And also I'm in a position where I can say, you can totally do this It's going to take a little bit longer, but you can do it. These are the things that you need to set in place. So it's not like, do my thing and you will make $100,000 a year. You know, like, (laughs) that's not what I'm there for. I'm not there to do that. (laughs) That's your job. (laughs) 
But what I'm saying is that I was able to sort of like sit back and dream into what this was for me and what I wanted to bring based on my strengths. And we're so happy. <laughs> we're so happy that you were able to sit back and dream. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> It's podcast angel number two time. I have never once in the history of Podcast Envy in 40 episodes had two podcast angel spots, but I felt like there's so much good content in this episode and I'm learning so much from Elsie that it's kind of nice to take a little breather here and do something kind of weird, which is to promote a podcast angel for which I am not getting compensated in any way, shape, or form. And that is Elsie's E-League, the podcast mentoring program that I was a part of maybe a year, a year and a half ago. Anyways, the program that really, really, really helped me to focus in on why I'm podcasting, where my niche is in the industry, and how to grow my platform beyond just the show itself. You can learn more about the E-League and see if it's a fit for you at lcescobar.com forward slash the letter E followed by the word league, E-League. Of course, linked in the show notes for this episode, 2019 dates are yet to be announced, and I have no doubt that you will want to know when that's happening. Also, I'm going to do an even weirder thing, which is to promote two things in the same spot, seemingly in competition with each other, but not really. I am also offering, beginning in January 2019, the Podcast Envy VIP Circle, which is also a podcast mentoring program for podcasters who are already producing their show. And this is going to be a growing opportunity, ongoing support, mentoring, and coaching in a group environment. And the more members who sign up, the more perks and benefits there will be. I'm so excited about this program. I finally have a few details ready to share with you, and I'm about to send the first sneak peek of what the VIP circle will look like to those who have signed up to get into the circle once it becomes available. You still have time to get on that list. Just go to thecreativeimposter.com forward slash grow together, because that's what we're going to do. Grow together. Thecreativeimposter.com forward slash grow together. Get your name on the list. There is no obligation to join or sign up, but you will be the first to know how this program is going to roll out in January. And if you are one of the first to join, you will also get a complimentary 30-minute coaching call with me. I have a few short answer questions that I've been asking of the different podcasters that I have on the show because I think it does answer some of the questions that people come to me frequently with. So... Cover art and theme music for your podcasts. How do you come up with those? Oh my gosh. You know, those kinds of things, it's so funny to me. Those two things, I'm like one of the fastest decision makers of that because I know that you could go down a rabbit hole and you will never come out. <laughs> exactly. Like you'll go, I have to listen to like music and you're like down two days. <laughs> <laughs> Two days just listening to music and never deciding. And so this is how I did mine. There were times that I was subscribed to this newsletter. I think it's called Mighty Deals. And what it does is that sends you like these random deals that have to do with fonts and graphical elements and audio elements and things like that. And they will have like a real cheap bundle of stuff. Like you can get all of these backgrounds for like $19 and you know, that kind of stuff. And so a couple of times they had audio deals and they had like something that was like 30 bucks and you get tons of music. And so I keep those and that's how I picked mine. So like that's where the She Podcast music came from. Not that necessarily that Jessica really, she didn't really like our music, but <laughs> I didn't want to spend a lot of time. I didn't want to yeah. spend a lot of time with it. And I literally was like, I have these, I'll listen to them. And then I picked four and I send those to her. And then she and I came down to like that one that we would agree on. And I was like, let's just do this one. <laughs> nice. In terms of the artwork, I do believe that for artwork, you do need to have at least a vision of what you would like to have. 
Uh-huh. ideas, look at magazines, like what's the feel that you want, like do that kind of stuff, like a fun thing like that. And then depending upon how much money you have, I would hire somebody to do it, but then I would really be clear with the designer and say, I want blues and greens and I need it to feel very earthy and it needs to look kind of like this and then send them pictures <laughs> of like stuff that you feel that you kind of want because a good designer, they'll get it and then they will give you some options. And of course, yeah, Canva does have some easy ways to do it. And you can start that way. I mean, I did Elsie's yoga class. Oh my gosh. I created my artwork using Pixelmator on my Mac with an image that I had. I just had a really cool image of me doing yoga at a beach and kind of chose a funky font. And I just used that and I kind of made it seem sort of nice and That's what I submitted. It wasn't until 2007, 2008 almost, that I actually had my artwork redone. And I just said, I need a change. I don't want to be the girl in the bikini at the beach anymore. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that's the great thing I always tell people is if they're getting tripped up on music or cover art, I'm like, just choose something and you can always change it. What is your biggest strength as a podcaster? Hmm. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I think to be able to feel like you can speak into anything, most anything, spur of the moment kind of thing. I think that that's one of those things where it's like there's a personality behind what I do and enthusiasm Mm -hmm. that I feel people can hear. And so they gravitate towards that. And that's happened ever since even when I was teaching so that there's an element of personality or something that you, you feel like, oh, I want to listen to her. You know, that kind of stuff. I always appreciated that even in your yoga podcast, I tried listening to so many meditation podcasts and I cannot because it's always this <laughs> voice <laughs> and I just can't. And I appreciated that your voice was appropriate for meditation, but it wasn't that. <laughs> <That's> right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. That's a really good way to put it. I mean, uh, that it is appropriate. But yeah, you're right. I think that that's probably one of my strengths where I can have an appropriate voice (laughs) given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. Is there anything that you dislike about podcasting? What a great question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. (laughs) Hmm. Like there's pet peeves and stuff that I have about certain podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. But not about podcasting. Maybe. Okay. So if I were to say something about podcasts, a pet peeve for me is when you start a show, like if you have intro music, that's like over 30 seconds, dude, no, no, like, no, get in it right away. Five, Mm -hmm. 10, 15 seconds tops. And it seems like that wouldn't be so bad, but 30 seconds of a song before the show starts is a lot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think In terms of like the podcasting in general right now, I think that there's still times when it makes me a little sad how difficult it can be for somebody to listen to a show still. Mm -hmm. And because I'm so immersed in it that it's so like, duh, I can totally listen to it. Like wherever I am, I'm going to be able to listen to your show, whether I have an iPhone or not. Like, Mm -hmm. let's say I have just my computer or let's say I have a different whatever I'm going to be able to listen to your show. That Mm -hmm. said, not very many people are that savvy nor that dedicated to actually do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to go out of my way to get the content that I want. Mm -hmm. I would like that to happen with podcasting as well or audio in general. I feel audio in general. I think it's a little bit more challenging to be able to negotiate where it goes, how to listen, where to put it what's happening here. All of those things are still a little complicated for people. There's so many options, but it's almost like there's too many options and they're also Mm. weird, like not mainstream, (laughs) not obvious enough. No. And it's like one of my best friends, you know, she texted me the other day and she was like, well, okay, I still don't get it. If I listen to a podcast, am I using data? Mm -hmm. (laughs) No, it's really confusing. Yeah. And so then I have to like sit down and I have to explain because, again, that's privilege right there. Like Mm -hmm. I have the privilege of unlimited data. 
because obviously where I live at this moment, it is my only source of connection. So it, it actually is all the things for me. It's my Wi-Fi, it's my cell phone, it's my lifeline, it's my work, it's all the things. So therefore, mm-hmm. having unlimited data is absolutely necessary for me. That said, though, even if it wasn't necessary, there's a lot of people who buy unlimited data because they can't afford it. But there's a lot of people who don't want to be spending as much money as I spend on cell service. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like that matters. Yeah. Data matters. Downloads matter. Workflow matters. You got to find out where the setting is and how you get to it. I have a, a client. She, she's actually a yoga client of mine who she got an iPhone. She started listening to podcasts. She loves them. And she said to me one day, I don't know what's happening, but lately every podcast I listen to, it feels like they're talking so fast. And I don't know if I'm just getting Uh, old or why it sounds like they're talking so fast. I can barely understand them. And I was like, can I see your phone? And she said, sure. She had accidentally put it on 1.5 speed and Uh, she didn't even know that you could change the speed. So she literally thought that she was losing her mind because suddenly everyone sounded like they were talking. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. I did see a couple of people. I can't remember if it was in She Podcast or in the E-League group. But I did see a couple of people talking about offering classes on how to listen to podcasts. And yes, like, for sure. Oh, Absolutely. This yeah. is so crazy that you need to teach people, but you do. But you do. <laughs> that's my next step. And I feel like that's a big challenge that I'm putting to myself as well, because I keep telling you all to do it. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm going to do that over at the library. We're going to have a podcast listening day. And for me, it would be like very zeroed in to mothers like that. I think I could teach a class to moms, especially moms of younger children that are coming to the library and then would just have a class on how to listen to podcasts and offer different podcasts. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can do this and this is why it's important. And this is what you could do with your kids. And this is what you could do for yourself. And this is when you listen It's not just how to, it's when, because Mm -hmm. it's out of people's scope. A lot of us are like, oh, I watch Netflix when I do this. Mm -hmm. I watch movies or cable, whatever you have, when I do this at this time. This is when Mm -hmm. we do these things. But for the most people, they don't have the built in, this is when I listen to a podcast. Like that's the first question I get is like, when do you listen? And I'm like, when do I not? But that's just me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) but most people are like yeah so it's like when do you listen I'm like well okay so you have to really spell it out Mm -hmm. when you're doing dishes is a great time to listen to a show when you're taking a run when you go to the gym you know like all of these different ways but we have to spell it out for them for sure Elsie is there anything else that you I mean there's like a million things I could ask you and a million things that you could tell us about podcasting and social media but Unless people are listening to this on like quadruple speed, (laughs) they'll never get through it all. (laughs) Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners before we say goodbye? I think that all of us need to take responsibility to recognize the impact that we have with our people and to never take it for granted, to never use somebody else to take on the job of you getting the word out about how much impact you can bring to the world because it's not up to anybody else. It's not up to the network that you want to align with. It's not up to the hosting platform that you're using. It's not because of the player that you're putting on your show notes. It's not because of the app that you're not being featured in or you want to be featured in. It's not because of that. You are the boss. You have to advocate for your own work. And if it's hard for you to advocate for your own work, advocate for somebody else's. Sometimes you'll gain skills by promoting somebody else's work because you love them so much, it'll show you how to connect to that feeling so that you can do it for yourself. Brilliant. Thank you so much for being a part of this series. I'm so happy to have gotten this time with you. (laughs) Me too. I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me on. I mean, you're doing such great work. Anything I can do, anything I can do. Oh my gosh. I cannot even tell you how honored I am to have had this time with Elsie, to have gotten all of this wisdom and all of this amazing content here on Podcast Envy for you. If you do not already know Elsie, please get to know her. 
visit her website, learn about the E-League, listen to She Podcasts. And if you happen to be a quote unquote She Podcaster, join the She Podcasts Facebook group. It is an incredible resource. I cannot say enough about how much mentoring and how much having a group of colleagues supporting you and cheering you on makes a huge difference in your podcasting experience. Seriously, it's like exponential wow. So whether that's the E-League with Elsie or the VIP circle with me or honestly both, I just know that your show and your podcast lifestyle is just going to blow your mind in 2019. Also, if you are not already a listener of The Feed, Libsyn's official podcast, and you want to stay current on all things podcasting, opportunities, news, changes in the industry, that is definitely the place to go. In the meantime, I want to leave you with a quote going back to this book brick wall exhibit that Elsie mentioned by Jorge Mendez Blake. I found one artist website that quoted his philosophy around these literature-based, book-based installations. Quote, writing is itself a kind of construction and reading is a way of creation. End quote. And when I read that, I thought, hmm, if that's true, could we also say as impact podcasters that podcasting is itself a kind of construction and listening is a way of creation? Thank you so much for tuning in. I can't wait to give you one final episode of 2018 on New Year's Eve, December 31st. I am grateful to you for being a part of this growing community. Peace, love, and podcasting. Enjoy your holiday season. Podcast Envy is produced by your podcast boss, Andrea Klunder. That's me. The Podcast Envy theme music is by Valentin Sosnitsky, courtesy of the Free Sound Project at freesound.org, and our podcast angel music is by Benjamin Masterpolito, also on freesound.org as Lemon Cream. All music is licensed under the Creative Commons. Our episodes are mixed by Edwin Ruiz, and hey, if you want your show to sound as good as ours, hire us. Put the magic audio mojo of the Creative Imposter Studios to work for you. Thanks so much for listening, and here's to making your podcast the envy of everyone else.